This week we have a request from friend of the show, Lucas. Lucas has a question about a phrase in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3, particularly as it's translated in the NIV, the New International Version. So let's take a look at that first. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality. That's the phrase in question, a hint of sexual immorality, or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. So I want to look at it in two other versions, first the King James and then the ESV. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. There's the King James and then the ESV. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. So the NIV gave us not even a hint of sexual immorality. The King James said it should not be named even once. And then the uh, ESV said it should not even be named among you. Like these, these things, sexual immorality, uh, every impurity, and covetousness or greed are things that shouldn't be hinted at or named within the faith community in Ephesus, because that's who Paul was writing to, the Ephesians. Um, there's a couple of really interesting things here. Let's dig in and take a look. We'll pull the verse apart in two halves and uh, see what we find there. So first up, porneia dekai akatharsia pasa e pleonexia. So we'll start with that first half. So de, the post particle there, the, is the post positive, pardon me, is but, uh, porneia, fornication or sexual immorality, kai akatharsia pasa, and every impurity. So akathars, uh, akatharsia, so katharizo, I cleanse, uh, akatharizo is to be impure, akatharsia is to be impure, unclean. Pasa, every. So sexual immorality or fornication and every kind of impurity, a pleonexia or uh, greed, covetousness, or I would translate it as excess because by extension, it means covetousness or greed, but at its heart, pleonexia is about excess. So think about it this way. Fornication, sexual immorality, is a fairly concrete concept, and it's the first one that he gives us. Then he says, and every impurity or excess. So we have sort of a concrete example and then a broad category that covers everything else under that heading, right? So we've got fornication, sexual immorality, every kind of impurity or excess that is part of sort of Sin Mountain. And the reason I choose to call it Sin Mountain there is because we're getting uh, a, a, a sensitive conjunction. <clears throat> we're joining things together that reach a summit, a sensitive. You ascend the summit. So all kinds of impurities and excesses are the mountain that lead to the summit. And what's at the summit? Fornication, porneia, uh, sexual immorality. So in a sense, um, Paul gives us uh, one thing, sin mountain, that is typified with fornication at the top and every impurity and excess is uh, on the slopes of the mountain coming down to the base. Uh, pretty interesting stuff. Why does that matter? Because in the second half of the verse, he's going to treat those three things that he put together in the first half as one thing. So these are not individual things. When we look at the second half of the verse, we're not to treat them as individual things, fornication, impurity, and covetousness. We're to treat them as one thing, fornication and every impurity or excess that leads up to or that is under that kind of heading. That's pretty significant. So let's look at the second half and see why I'm saying he treats them as one thing. 
Mede, uh, onomazesto, and humin, kathos, prepe, hagiois. So, mede onomazesto. Uh, mede is a combination of day, but, uh, or even, and me, the negative. And then we get the verb, which is a present passive imperative, third person singular. Onomazesto, uh, should, because of the negation from mede, <clears throat> must not be named or shall not be named. It's, uh, it's a passive imperative. This thing shall not be named. What thing? Fornication, sexual immorality, uh, and every impurity or excess. This thing, this one thing, third person singular, see he's treating those three things as one thing, uh, must not even be named and humane among you, uh, kathos prepe hagiois, uh, as is fitting for saints. Uh, so, so what is he saying about it? He's using this verb, anamadzo, um, which occurs nine times in the New Testament, rather than kaleo, the much more common called, because he wants us to understand something. Uh, anamadzo means either I name, I identify, or I denote. So if you're using it about identifying something, it's, it can be used to recognize a thing. Hey, what, what's that thing over there? It looks like a horse, but it's not a horse because I see a horn sticking out of its head. Ah, I recognize, I identify a unicorn, right? So it can mean not that I'm giving something a new name, but I'm giving it a name as... I identify it or I recognize it. I denote its presence here in this place. And so if we take it in that sense, what Paul is saying is, to go to the, to go to the NIV, there shouldn't even be a hint of this thing, or to go to the ESV, it shouldn't even be named among you. Um, this is a thing that should be so rare should, is so foreign to the faith community that uh, not only should it not be practiced, it should be so rare as to go unidentifiable or undenoted. Um, if we find ourselves seeing it and naming it, recognizing it and identifying it, it's a sign that something's gone horribly wrong because this stuff is supposed to be alien to the faith community. Not even a hint, not even a mention, shouldn't be named among you because it's unfitting within the community of saints for sexual immorality and every impurity or excess to be present here in the faith community. So um, why shouldn't it be named? Because it should be that rare. Does it mean it'll never happen? That's not realistic. But when we're looking at the way the community is structured and its purpose, this is not supposed to be a part of the community's experience. I want to look at a corollary in 1 Corinthians 5, where Paul, again, is writing to another faith community, and he makes a very similar argument. But instead of talking about the behavior, he's talking about uh, members of the faith community and their behavior. So here we have 1 Corinthians 5, 11, again from the ESV. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. So let's look at this phrase in, in Koine. Aeon tis adelphos uh, onomadzamenos. So onomadzamenos is a passive participle. It's a perfect tense passive participle. Having been named. Okay, so he starts out aeon if tis anyone 
uh, Onomad Zamenos ha having been named Adelphos, a brother. So if you have someone in the community who having been named a brother who is engaged flagrantly, openly, continually in sexual immorality, greed or covetousness or idolatry or as a reviler, a drunkard, a swindler, you should have nothing to do with this person because just like the behaviors in Ephesians 5.3 aren't supposed to be present in the faith community, the behaviors that are noted in 1 Corinthians 5.11 aren't to be present in the life of someone having been named a brother, someone having been named a believer in the community, someone who has been accepted as part of the people who are following Christ and who have accepted, who have engaged in repentance and forgiveness of sins, these are not behaviors that are supposed to be a part of their lives. If they are a part of their lives, Paul says, don't have anything to do with that one having been named a brother, because that's not really a brother. He says, don't even eat with them. Why does he say that? In the Old and New Testaments, eating with someone is a sign that you are at peace with them. It's a sign of acceptance. And so I've, I've always uh, jokingly said, you, you rarely invite your blood enemies to supper, right? Because that's just, when you eat with people, it's, uh, it's a lowering of the guard. It's a welcoming in. It's a hospitality move. It's not something that you do when you're in enmity with people. And so here he says, when you encounter someone, what kind of someone? Someone having been named a brother, but you see that they're engaged in these kind of behaviors uh, on a large scale in the regular. We're not talking about someone who makes a mistake and repents and seeks forgiveness and atonement and restoration, reconciliation. We're talking about someone's whose life, someone whose life is in opposition to the, to the uh, values of the brotherhood, of the family of faith, someone who is engaging uh, openly, fragrant, flagrantly, and continually in things that don't belong in the faith community, Paul says, have nothing to do with them. Uh, don't even eat with them. Separate yourself from them. Why? Because that is not a real brother. That is not... Uh, someone who is serious about their pursuit of discipleship and following the one who made repentance and forgiveness available. So uh, you should go and look at the next two verses, 12 and 13 in 1 Corinthians 5, and see just how serious Paul is about this issue. Um, but let's get back to Luke's question. How are we to take this notion of not even a hint? I think it's clear when we look at the two verses together that these things like fornication, every impurity or, uh, ex or excess that leads to idolatry and slander and reviling, these things have no place within the community of faith. And therefore, they should be unidentifiable. Not that you don't know what they are, but you shouldn't be able to spot them in the faith community because they're supposed to be that alien. There shouldn't be a hint of these things. They should go unnamed because they, they're not supposed to exist within the faith community. If you see them prevalent in somebody's life in the faith community, at some point you're going to have to cut that person loose and have nothing to do with them because it's contrary it's uh, oxymoronic. It's, uh, it's the antithesis of what the faith community is supposed to be because the faith community follows the one who put a, came to put an end to sin and death, not to embrace it. Not a hint, not even uh, named because it's supposed to be that rare within the faith community and within the members the brethren of the faith community. So Lucas, I hope that answered your question. I hope that was valuable for everyone who saw it. Uh, and uh, if it was, you know what to do with the liking, sharing, subscribing, hitting the notification thing, or telling your friends, leaving a little feedback in the comment because the algorithm loves uh, comments. It wants to know that people are engaging 
with videos. So help me out, help out the channel, leave a comment, let me know what you think. And until next time, Kars Kairi Humine, grace and peace to you.